Arkamoto interview with Mark Fronmeyer, part two. Hey guys, it's Brian from My Tesla Weekend, back again with, you know, another one of these. Uh, if you hate these, don't unsubscribe, just uh, skip on to the next one. I mean... My God, you guys, what's going on? Hey, 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 thanks to my latest, uh, you know, uh, patrons. And uh, also thanks to the rest of you for hitting the thummy thing early, subscribing, follow me on Twitter, and, you know, all of that stuff. So let's get going. So, Mark, I've got a viewer question here. All right. Let's see here. Where did I put it? Gerhard Cromer asks, Idaho deliveries? Uh, yes, eventually. So, you know, we're, we're basically, we've established what I would say are uh, some of our main, um, you know, beachhead markets. Right. I mean, they are literally beach markets. So San Diego, Florida, we've now got vehicles in Hawaii. Um, and th those were sort of the three in the, the South Belt. Uh, and we see New York, coming soon. They just passed an auto cycle bill, which is going to be much less hassle for our customers, which is awesome. Um, and then from each of those kind of corners, uh, you, can see, you can see us opening the map in each direction. We want to make sure that we've got service coverage that, you know, I, and I think a lot of it, we, we did definitely want to keep our early production vehicles as close to some, you know, sort of home bases as possible, um, just for uh, care and maintenance, which has been, you know, obviously complicated by things like a global pandemic. Um, uh, as, as we continue to accelerate the growth of all those programs, that will be, you know, sort of more and more and more states. And Idaho is our neighbor, uh, right. you know, so I think it's, uh, we, would, we would very much like to get vehicles in there. We have not announced uh, a timeline okay. for opening Idaho, and I'm not going to do that in this moment. Okay. You'll give me some exclusives later. I can feel it. <laughs> That leads into what are some of the state by state nonsense regulations that you've had to contend with? Uh, you know, and I wouldn't say it's necessarily nonsense. I think a lot of those, you know, it's the motor vehicle law is there's federal motor vehicle law, federal motor vehicle safety standards, the compl all the compliance tests to actually be a, a legal on road vehicle in various different classes. Sure. And then state by state, um, there is just a whole patchwork of rules around, typically around, um, you know, what sort of licensing you need for each different type of vehicle out there, uh, what uh, additional safety gear you need, like a helmet, um, what the rules are for who can sell in a state, oh, wow. uh, what what service requirements are linked to having vehicles. What I mean, there's, yeah, there's it's uh, the automotive and well, really the vehicle. Um, industry is is one of the most highly regulated wow. uh, industries uh, uh, in the world across all of these different jurisdictions so would you say um, that for all 50 states you're looking at hundreds of individual different considerations uh, it's it's typically the same sort of big categories you know it's a handful of big categories but every state has different processes for applying for uh, a manufacturer's license for applying for a dealer's license for and then even down to like what land use, right? Can you can you actually operate a rental type business in a particular geography? Sure. Um, and so all that just is it's it's a lot to learn as a new organization. Um, and this is really the phase, you know. So so the early phase of Arkimoto was really focused on what are we going to build and how are we going to build it. And now it is, how are we, how, how, how are we going to deploy it into the world? How um, are we allowed to sell it? It's how are we allowed to sell it? I think, I do think that the, the demo rental model really, there, there are two things that I think really play in Arkimoto's favor that aren't true of automobiles. You know, okay. one is um, that the, the demo rental model has different sets of requirements. I think in, in many ways, lesser sets of requirements than motor vehicle sales okay. in various states. And then second is, it, we build smaller vehicles, which means that you can ship them more, much more easily common carrier. So somebody can buy a vehicle oh. in Oregon and have it delivered to them in a state, even if that state doesn't allow direct sales from the company. Does it fit in a crate? It doesn't fit in a crate, but it, you know, it's, uh, we've, we've put up to six of them in a box truck. Wow. So 
That's good. It's a, and then you know we we teamed up with DHL pretty early on in the in the production deployment process, and they've been very helpful in terms of getting vehicles out into the market without us having to sort of build out our own delivery fleet. Sure. I, and I think that that really is the, the more it's, it's kind of an Arcimoto baked in philosophy. We we certainly pride ourselves on capital efficiency, but part of that is just where we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We really try not to. Right. So another viewer question, Betty Swalix wants to know Europe and international deliveries. Uh, I, you know, we, we hired a, a Dilip Sundaram as a, okay. our chief international business officer a little less than a year ago. Um, and he has actually been instrumental in not just building out our international strategy, but uh, building out our internal sales team and a, a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, but he is now very laser focused on uh, the international growth story. And for us, that means really, you know, we're, what we're building at the ramp, what we're designing is intended to be a replicable pattern for production of the platforms and vehicles that we build so that we can easily spin up, well, you know, easily, so right. that we can, so that to, in order to make it possible yes. that we can spin up copies of that production footprint in other locales around the world where we think the vehicles make sense. And Europe, Southeast, actually basically almost everywhere, sure. we think this electric platform makes a ton of sense. Sure. And I think the way that we, the, the flexibility of the platform, the cool thing about this platform is that as we go into other locales, um, the ability to sort of tune the hat that goes on the basic platform for that market, whether it's styling or actual functional differences between sure. products. Yeah, if, if there's a need for it to carry X versus Y. Sure. So in interview parlance, maybe there's something you can help me out with. What exactly is a walk and talk? What is a walk and talk? I think it's uh, when you're like walking through a factory oh, and talking and asking questions, asking questions, mm. giving answers. Mm. Huh. That makes sense. I didn't even realize. That. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty crazy how people do that. Huh. Huh. Oh, well. Yeah. So, uh, so we had talked about the weight of the mean lean machine. So now we can talk about the Mean Lean Machine. Now, uh, it's it's up on the screen right now. Why don't you give a 30 second hot take on what it is? Uh, well, the Mean Lean Machine is Arkimoto's version of an e-trike. Uh, and it's, it's, it is our first, you know, so the, 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 the ceiling for micro mobility is 1100 pounds. And if we hit our targets with one X, we will just tuck under that 1100 pounds. Right for the FUV. Right. Um, but what I think of as sort of true micromobility is in the e-bike, e-scooter, sure. much lighter weight vehicles that solve that same basic transportation problem we're trying to solve. Okay. And what we, it, it, this is actually, honestly, this is one of those times where a product I, concept just almost fully formed itself very quickly. Um, and I, uh, I was actually sitting just inside this window I was sitting in my living room, I opened my eyes, I looked out, and I see this bearded hippie ripping down the street on a recumbent bike. And he was going way too fast, and he wasn't pedaling very hard, and he had a big grin on his face. And I had this thought, like, I gotta call Bob Mile. And Bob is the founder of Tilting Motorworks, who has been working on tilting three-wheel vehicles. And it was just like, because Bob and I have been, had been trying for years to figure out how can we work together. Right. And it's, it's actually very hard for startups in the electric vehicle space to work with other startups in the electric vehicle space. Hmm. It's, it's almost always the case that a startup will work with a much larger organization to do some kind of little niche technology piece. Um, and in the case of, of working with Bob, you know, Bob had invented this technology for tilting three-wheelers, but specifically a product, a, a bolt-on accessory for a Harley or right. big, tr big motorcycle to turn it into a leaning motorcycle. Um, and he really, he had, so tilting three wheelers, uh, I've been following him for ever, well, ever since the beginning of Arkimoto. Sure. And this is that concept to, to really hit a lightweight three wheeler, you got to make it lean. Um, but, um, all of the systems that I had seen, you know, these, these are all, were almost all one-off prototypes. So, you know, BMW had multiple tilting three wheel prototypes in the nineties and two thousands and. There was the, the original Lean Machine from GM. There was the, the Carver, which was sort of the next iteration of that. But 
all of them sort of didn't work enough to be able to get into the market, right? So I wasn't willing to make that bet when starting Arkimoto. So when it comes to comparing the Mean Lean Machine to the FUV, how many fewer parts are we talking? How much simpler? Oh, oh I mean, just like ninety percent dr dramatically simpler. Yeah. Um, and if you th yeah, think about, one, one way to think about it is, uh, so if you look at that graph of, you know, the one Hummer, two right. Model Ys, eight FUVs, 100 mean lean machines, and you think about how much does a decent e-bike cost? So you multiply, like what's, what's your revenue, nice. revenue value of materials right. for each of those different approaches? And it turns out that actually the revenue value of materials for the mean lean machine blows away anything else on that graph. Uh, and a good e-bike is, is, runs how much? Oh, I mean, the, the, the sweet spot right now for a good e-bike, I think, I've been told by e-bike shop owners, is mm -hmm. like in the three to 5,000 range. That sounds right. What I've, in my research, what I've found is that the cheapest with the poor reviews is still $1,000. Yeah. With bad reviews. And, and we, so to be clear, we weren't, uh, we don't, like we didn't build the Mean Lean Machine as a competitor right. for e-bikes. No. Um, what we built it for ultimately is the same reason for building the FUV, which is to provide another way out of the car, right? right? And, in, and, then, and then the question was, well, how, what features can we add in right. order to make a bicycle class vehicle more, att more attractive? So the three wheels gives it awesome stability, awesome handling, the ability to carry more stuff. You know, you're, you're not going to slide out because you got two wheels in front, better braking. Um, and just a super fun, very plush ride. And then on top of that, we added, uh, there's no chain. There's no, there, you don't get grease on your pants. There's actually a motor on all three wheels. So we're, we're gonna apply, you know, sort of a similar torque vectoring approach uh, to what we did, uh, what we're now doing with the FUV uh, to give you just really, what we think we will end up with really good traction uh, and you're pedaling a generator. So your generator is your throttle. It's also something you can use to charge the bike up when it's not moving. And does that mean in theory you have infinite range? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you can, you can, let's say you want to go on a long trip, you can, you can charge it up stationary and then ride with it as you're pedaling and then charge it up stationary and then ride right. with it as it's pedaling. You could, and in theory. You could, yeah. Go as far as you want it. If you had the time. But the, the other cool thing about e-bikes is that they just, they require, again, they're, they're another giant leap of efficiency. So they really sure. don't, even if you plug it into a wall or uh, it, plug it into a solar panel, a, a, you know, a modest solar panel can actually generate a, a reasonable amount of range for something sure. that's, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know what our final stats are going to be, but, you know, we're aiming for, you know, 30 to 50 watt hours per mile. I think we, we, we may beat that. We'll see. A mad thanks, as always, to my amazing, gracious Patreons who get early access, bonus content, an ad-free experience, and for those at the $10 level and above, access to my 11-year tracker. For those of you who are already in the know, you've seen my spreadsheets. They are fantastic. But, you know, if you don't know what they are, Fair enough. So what did I miss or misunderstand? Leave me all your thoughts, your comments, your blind and brilliance, your wisdom in them comments below. And stay tuned, my friends. Stay juicy. And I simply cannot wait to hear from you when I'm live streaming. At Giga Texas.